All right, just a quick little update. I'm going to be away from the cotton plot for about half a week. And I don't have any other update videos in the queue, so I figured I'd make a little quick something for this week. So, really, nothing else to report other than productivity looks good. As you can see right there, I'm putting on plenty of healthy large bulls up here in the top of the canopy. So, as long as we don't get like a crazy early frost in November, I foresee a whole lot more cotton to be picked. And it's that way across the board, all, all four rows. Lots, lots of large balls, bulls way up in the tree. Currently, I'm still picking very low. I've got a couple of things here and there, one or two that have opened up in the mid-story, but everything I've been picking for the most part has been down at the bottom. I just picked one more perfect bull that is going to go into my personal collection. So cut that hole. And I am halfway through picking today. Uh, not a lot to be picked. Just had a good rainfall yesterday. Uh, everything is nice and damp, but it wasn't a deep rain. As you can see, there's some dry spots down there. Uh, it was like that last week. Had a nice light rainfall on Monday, uh, Sunday night and Monday. And yesterday we had a nice light rainfall on Sunday. But we're in a drought and we need more than that. And I foresee the cotton stalling. Um, maturation ever longer the more this drought goes on so yeah just typical farmer stuff praying for rain praying for not too much rain praying for it to be not so hot but not so cold you know we do have some stuff opening this is opening in the mid-story but as you can see this is an underdeveloped bowl um, well fairly certain it is we'll crack it a little bit and give it a closer look in here yeah that's underdeveloped Nice and mature on that side, rotten on that side. And the other one is probably totally rotten on the third ovary. And that's how all of these things that you see like this will turn out. These sort of sickly looking ones. Stuff like this that's already reached this size, this will come out nice looking. I hope, it, I hope I'll be able to get a lot more for the museum as well as a lot more for my own ginning purposes and seed selection. I hope to expand this plot as I've said before. It's about twice the size, and I think I'm just going to go out this way. I like having north-south rows. That seems to be really good for weed control. And I think I'll just extend this out to about there. A little bit past 50 foot, because I want to do a wider spacing and still have 100 plants. So if I've got four rows, it's going to have to be 25 plants, and I'm at 13 now. So I'll gain one more here. Push it out just so far that way that we still have a driveway over there and that I can get 100 plants in here total. Uh, and if that's not really doable, I'll add a fifth row over there. And then I only have to push it out a little bit further. Because then I can have 20 per row. And that's my plan. I have no designs to cease this program anytime soon, and really I've been thinking a lot about it recently, just the connotations around growing Sea Island cotton. A lot of people want to see it, see this as a slave crop, but really the story we're telling here with the Hutchinson House is the second half of the life of Sea Island cotton. The first 75 years Sea Island cotton was grown, it was grown by slaves for the profit of the plantation owner. And then after secession here on Edisto Island, the whites very quickly evacuated the island. We were one of the first places invaded by the uh, Union Army, well the Union Navy I should say, and the island became a, a freedman's paradise. Well, I guess they weren't technically freedmen yet. They were just slaves without masters, slaves to themselves, free by every, every definition other than US law. And they, they prospered. They mostly just grew crops. And then when the war ended and the plantation owners came back, they were absolutely poor and destitute. And the freedmen got land from the Freedmen's Bureau or through uh, partnerships of land acquisition. They acquired their own land. They started growing Sea Island cotton because they found out they could sell it themselves. And they made money and they made wealth and they secured a better future for themselves and their families. And the plantation owners were poorer than they've ever been, even though they still had the land and they still had the people on the land working the land, growing the cotton, but the cotton was no longer theirs. They got rent and that's all they got. And the Freedmen community of Edisto Island did great. They succeeded. They were wealthy till the bull weevil came. 
And then in 1940, the USDA gave up on Sea Island cotton, and that was the end of the second 75 years of its life. And Henry Hutchinson really is the idolization of that existence of Sea Island cotton. He was born in 1860, the year of six succession, and he died 1939, the year that the USDA Florence Research Station, working to create bull weevil resistant strains of Sea Island cotton, shuttered. Now, the USDA continued growing Sea Island cotton in Johns Island for another three years until 1942, but they were focusing on hybrid strains at that point. And when the Johns Island Research Station shuttered, they gave up on Sea Island cotton and hybrids entirely. Henry Hutchinson and his 79 years of life really tells the tale through what he did with his home and with his cotton gin and with his family and his land and the work that his father did the second half of the story of Sea Island Cotton. And when you think about it, this right here, this delicate little yellow flower that only lasts a day and this fluffy little white stuff that rots in a few days if you don't pick it. This is the most important plant in American history. Right here, you're looking at it. This is the most historically significant plant in American history. This fueled the Southern economy for 75 years, it started the Civil War. It led to the abolishment of slavery. This plant, innocent of all of this, just another victim in the process. It was the catalyst for human greed and callous hearts that tore this nation apart, that put divides in this, in this country that we still have not healed. Scars that are still deep and still running red. This is the most historically significant plant in the history of the United States, and some people don't want to look at it. They think all it represents is slavery, and I feel it does not. It, it has a duality. It, lepre it represents both human suffering and triumph in the face of oppression. And I don't want to see something this important die, to become extinct again, to be lost a part of our history that we need to remember for all that it is, both good and bad. And that's really the core of why I'm doing this. Except for the fact that it's just a cool heirloom project and I'm a biologist and I like weird niche things, but really this is far more significant than anything I set out to do. And I have no desire to see that falter, to see this plant lost to the ages again. And that's why I'm gonna keep doing this. This is important for us. This is part of our heritage, our history. We need to know that something, something so insignificant, so delicate, so finicky as a, a mallow with fluffy white stuff could ruin a country, could destroy the lives of millions of people, could result in the bloodiest conflict in American history. We need not forget that.